My name is Rebecca Martin, and I am a graduate assistant with the grant facilitation team at the Rutgers University Edward J. Blastian School of Policy and Planning, and I'm working to coordinate the New Jersey Inclusive Healthy Communities Training Series and IHC Academy trainings. We're thrilled you could join us today for a grant writing training by Elaine Katz, Senior Vice President of Grants and Communications at Kessler Foundation. We are so fortunate to have her here today to educate us about how we can create successful grant proposals and to support our important work. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. We would like to um, make sure you're aware that we will be recording today's training. We have enabled captions for today's event and are thrilled to have Allison, our interpreter, with us. Um, if you would like to find her to pin her to your screen, look for her listed as interpreter Allison, and um, you can locate her in the gallery, click on the menu that appears in the top right hand corner when you hover your um, mouse over her image and you can pin her there. There will be time for questions and answers toward the end of the conversation today, so please feel free to add any questions that come up in the chat or hold them until the end when you'll be free to unmute and ask directly. Given your interest in today's training, we'd like to send you updates about future IHC training opportunities. If you would like to opt out of receiving information about the IHC program and training opportunities, you can indicate this in the chat or email me, and I'll place my email in the chat in a moment. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to express our deep appreciation to Perry Neron and her team at the New Jersey Division of Disability Services for making this training series and the IHC grant program possible. Now I will give the floor to our presenter, Elaine Katz. Elaine, thank you for coming today. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to thank you, New Jersey IHC, for inviting me to speak with you today. So today what we're going to do really is pull away the curtain on grant making, trying to be a little bit transparent about the process and help you become better informed when you apply for grants. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Kessler Foundation, for those of you who may not be familiar with our work. Uh, we're located in East Hanover, New Jersey, and our mission is to change the lives of people with disabilities through rehabilitation research, improving cognition and mobility for people with all kinds of disabilities. And we do that by testing new interventions and by gather gathering data that can help with daily functioning. We are also known as a leading funder for um, employment grants and innovation. And over the past 14 years, we've invested close to $50 million in the field of employment, trying to increase the participation rates of people with disabilities. Um, through these projects, we hope to create change in workplace and culture um, so that more people can be employed. So for today, in today's agenda, um, we're going to talk all about um, the specific components about grant making. However, we're not going to find um, talk about where to find actually funding. I have some resources at the end. Um, we're going to be speaking today from the private foundation or private corporate foundation perspective, not about getting grants from uh, the public sector, which would be federal grants or state grants or city grants, for example. Um, I really know best about, um, you know, the private foundation area, although we're a public charity, so we give away money and we raise money. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so, you know, grants are not really a slam dunk for when you, when an organization needs money because they are risky and they are chancy and you're not always going to get those funds. Um, grants can be time consuming in scope. Um, they really do take a lot of time and they often require some expertise and strategy in writing. Um, they're mainly different types of proposals. They range from a simple ask to really a more complex letter or maybe a two-step application. And today we're going to give you a whole overview of the process. We're going to help you identify the key components, uh, learn a little bit about how funders do select those grants, and understand how the funders work and collaborate with grantees. To make sure that we're all on the same page, um, I'd like to go through a little bit about the terminology in grant making and defining some terms. So it's pretty obvious the grant award is the money you will get. It's not a loan, so it's not expected to be paid back. Um, we're not talking today about grants to individuals, which is a whole separate category. Um, but really there is an expectation, if you will, that is going towards a certain purpose and has a positive impact on the community. 
when we're talking about the grantor, the funder, that's the organization that's giving you the money. And grants are typically managed by a grant officer, or a program officer, some other formal title. If you want to think about them, uh, think of them as a salesperson, the middle person, middleman. Um, it's really the individual that is driving or moving your proposal along in a foundation or granting organization. The grant period is the time the grant takes place. And grant evaluation, grant reporting is really the due diligence about the grant. What's been accomplished? What are your objectives? Uh, this could be a self-report, an informal report, or it could be a more uh, formal grant evaluation. So let's talk a little bit about the myths about funders. Um, I would say foundations and grant makers are typically the target of uh, myths, um, and there's a lot of them. Uh, there's a book by Joel Fleshman called uh, The Foundation, the, A Great American Secret, How Private Wealth Changed the World. And he discusses a lot of these myths, um, generalizations. Some are unfair, some truly are fair. Um, and you've probably experienced some of these yourself that, uh, you know, foundation people are hard to reach. They don't take phone calls. Um, they don't often have open calls for, for proposals called requests for proposals. Sometimes it's a failure to communicate. Um, they could let months go by without you hearing from them. Um, they drag out their decision making. They may not write you um, or reply to any of your inquiries. Um, sometimes you'll find they're even discourteous or rude, like, who are you to apply to me, to my foundation, to try to get some funding? Um, you know, and again, you don't find out any information because you can't get a hold of them. And I would say most most of the time, a lot of a lot of people who who apply for funding, I think they're arbitrary grant decisions made by the foundations. And, and truly, I would say most of the people I know at foundations are trying to make strategic choices and rational grant making to move ahead um, their fun, funding. Um, they're using rubrics or different kinds of scales to evaluate the applications that come in. But but it is subject to process. You know, it's not. It's an art rather than a science. Um, sometimes foundations don't explain the grant making process. So those applying are, are really in the dark. Um, but there are organizations such as um, grant makers for effective organizations, which are and some other very, very large foundations that are trying to make uh, this a little more transparent. So um, briefly, I'm gonna go through the grant process so that everybody is on the same page. And I do have some very short videos. These are older videos from the Foundation Center in New York, which is now Candid. Uh, some, most of the people have left where they are that you'll see in the video, although they are real people. Um, hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, we can talk through the information on the video. So uh, let's see and get going. For organizations approaching us for the first time, generally we encourage you to first visit our website, read our funding guidelines and approach. Uh, the next step would be a letter of inquiry and um, all of those get a screen by program staff. And if there's something that looks like it would be a fit for us, we will reach out to have an initial conversation. Organizations for, that are approaching us for the very first time should really make sure that what they're doing, the programs and the projects that they're involved with, match up pretty pretty closely with the programs that we kind of that we support that's listed on our website. So we have three very specific grant making areas, and their projects really align with those three areas. I think grantees are most successful when they've done their homework in advance of a meeting. They know what the foundation is interested in funding. They've been to our website. They've looked at what our other grantees are doing. Um, and then take the time in their first meeting uh, to use it as an informational interview, to understand further what we're interested in, to understand what the state of our funding is, and frankly, what my needs as a program officer are in finding um, new opportunities to fund their work. Okay, so you heard a little bit from the funders that it's a you know that you should have a letter of inquiry if you really don't know the funding source just to get some outreach find out what they're all about um when you're applying try to make sure that there's a right fit in the program match do your homework in advance of a meeting or talking to any foundation officer and, and really use those information interviews to learn more about their processes and again it's always best to connect with funders when you're not seeking a grant 
Um, you can find those opportunities to network with them. Sometimes they're community events where um, they're invited and you're invited. Um, people on your board may know somebody at a foundation. You may meet them in different places. Um, you know, at, at a minimum, you can connect with people on social media, uh, such as LinkedIn. And, you know, it's always good to talk, try to talk to a foundation and catch them when you're not on the line for asking for funding and it's a more relaxed atmosphere. So let's get started with grant proposals, which is what I know everybody wants to hear about. Um, and keep in mind, these getting started points are before you even start writing a grant. I can't emphasize enough the importance of prepping before writing and before submitting an application. So we're going to identify the problem and the opportunity. What that means is you have identified already the programs, the projects that need some funding, because it's always better to try to match your program to a funding source. You never want to tailor a program to a funding source. So if it's a call for uh, child care, you don't want to create something that is a child care program just to get some funding from a funder. You want to make sure you do your research on the funder. You want to find as much information as you can online. You want to read their 990s, which may be tax returns. But more than anything these days, you want to know what the public perception is of a funder just to make sure that your organization is aligned with that group and it's not a controversial political group that some of your trustees or others may have difficulty with. You want to understand the work that's required. It's just as much time to apply for a $5,000 grant as it is for a $25,000 grant. So you want to make sure that you understand the grant requirements, the sections, what's required. Um, another good tip is to keep an internal data sheet of when you're applying for a grant and what's the outcome. You may also want to keep a list of prospects, um, but that way you can track your work over time. And if you can get a hold of sample proposals uh, from a particular funder, that's always great as well. You want to make sure that you read the application and the requirements as best you can. Again, this is all before you start writing the grant. Uh, funders are usually pretty specific on what they're looking for, and you want to make sure if you are not the only writer, um, you want to make sure who's going to write what sections. Um, and also you want to try to figure out if if you know, what the project that you're applying for is something that the funder will really fund. At this point, you, always, you also want to write a summary statement as well of your project. Um, you know, and again, what's the project you're looking for? Um, what you're looking for to fund? Um, you know, who are you? What's going on? What's the best information to use in an abstract? Excuse me. <laughs> And remember, your project is important. It's a gap in knowledge and resources and the opportunity to be filled. And you know, keep in mind again, that this is before you write, you can always tweak something later, but this is really the start. Oops, okay, so you're gonna develop a budget. Um, this is a preliminary budget. Again, it's the preliminary budget that's used to help you write the proposal. How do you know how many staffing you need unless you've looked at and planned out in a budget? How much you need to accomplish? Again, it goes back to your budget. If you're serving meals, how many meals are you serving? How many people are you serving? That's all part of preparing the budget. You want to also create the outline. You want to describe your the plan. You want to tie it back to the RFP. You want to figure out who's writing the sections, what terminology may you're using, um, what is the funder requiring as far as um, terminology and sections. You're still, again, not writing the grant. You want to most importantly get your PR house in order. You want to look at your social media. You want to make sure your website looks good. You want to make sure that there's nothing controversial on your Facebook posts, on your Instagram posts, because these days funders do look at all that stuff as well. So once you get all this prep work, now you're finally ready to get started and to write. Okay, so let's set the stage. 
So when you're starting to write, you really want to be simple, direct, and concise. And you want to know that this is about the project. Don't spend a lot of time when you're writing about the goals of your organization, the mission of your organization. Those are things that we can funders can find out about. Um, you really want to devote, especially if you have a limited amount of space, is to really talk about that project. You don't want to have blanket statements about anything without backing it up. You want to define your technical terms. And most importantly, the reader of the proposal shouldn't have a hard time understanding what you're talking about. If I read through a proposal and I don't understand what's going on, then that's not a very good sign of having a good chance of being funded for your project. And again, it's really important to be concise. You want to draft, write, and rewrite. You want to start a first draft from start to finish, including those sections that other people may write, because you want to go back and make it sound like it has one voice. Other people may have a different style. They may use a different grammar tense, you want to go back and really make sure that it all looks the same. Um, you want to make sure those sections are in the right places as far as the requirements for um, the particular funder. And again, you know, if, if you're resubmitting a request, don't use the same request. We do, you know, everything now is on the computer. I can easily compare what you sent us before to what it is now. And even if it's the same request, some of the sections I understand are going to be the same, but try to shake it up a little bit. Um, and you want to make sure to use keywords and phrasing. So if a funder says, what is the value of this project? You want to say the value of this project is. So as a reader, the reader doesn't have to hunt around to really get all the information um, that they're looking for. Clearly state the goals and how the fund is going to be used. You really, funding will be used. You really want to make sure they're SMART goals. Um, the acronym is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. So if, for example, you're serving meals to children, you want to, instead of saying, we will be serving lunch every day to a group of children, you want to say, 10 children will receive lunches three days a week. And even better is um, you could add in parens um, at $10 a lunch. And that kind of goes back to the development of a budget and justification. So this is the point where you're really fine tuning your budget. You're using the real numbers. You're not making them up. Uh, you may need a finance person or somebody else to help you go through. Please add your numbers. We find a lot of um, arithmetic mistakes in budgets, which we do add the numbers again. And if you change the grant at any point in time during a rewrite. So you start off with 10 children for lunches, you move to 15 children for lunches or other numbers change. Please make sure you go to your budget and you change that. We find lots of text does not match a budget. And a justification is often times asked or as optional, you know, provided if you want to provide a justification. My suggestion is always provide a justification. It helps to know how those numbers were derived. Typically, it's a very simple formula. So if 10 lunches are provided, the justification may say 10 lunches at, you know, $15 a lunch, whatever it may be. Um, if you don't provide a justification, still save all those documents of the computations, because if you get a call later on of how you got those numbers and you don't have any idea, that's also not a good sign. Okay, so finally, you've kind of reached the point where you may go down the black hole of waiting to see what happens to your grant, right? But before you do that, um, you want to make sure you've finalized and reviewed your draft. You've proofed it and you've proofed it again, which means you've read all the requirements, you rechecked everything, you have um, a clean hard copy on the side so you can cut and paste into an application. You may have even had one or two readers to make sure everything that you're writing makes sense, especially if they don't know the project uh, that closely. It always helps to have another eye for that. So now you have your clean version. 
You can upload it into an application. Make sure you leave at least three or four hours to before an application is due online. Even better the day before, because if you run into those tech issues, the bigger the foundation, you may be absolutely cut off. The smaller foundations may give you a little bit leeway if you have some tech issues, but you know when you're getting, and some foundations do get hundreds of applications, any little excuse to cut somebody off uh, may be used. Proof it one more time before you submit it. Sometimes um, the, the tool or the software application you're using to submit will let you print it. If you do, you can print it from offline. Otherwise, you have your clean copy of what the cut and paste was. Um, these days, a cover letter, cover letter isn't necessary, um, but you may have to, and maybe you're still not submitting online. Um, and one other point before we talk about follow-up. So sometimes you're asked for um, letters of support with an application, which means you're getting outside people to say, yes, they support this project. And typically an outside person like me, if you're asking for my um, help, will say, please send me a template. Um, send me what you want. Send me a sample of a document. Do not send everybody the same template. You don't want to see the file. I do not want to read three letters that are all the same with three different people on them. So please try to shake them up a little bit. They can all say about the same thing, but make it look like they're original letters. We all, you know, everybody on the foundation side knows the game. I've been on the ass side. I've been on the money giving side. You know, I know how the game is played. And yes, you can follow up lastly with a foundation. I think if, um, you know, they say applications are due March 1st, you haven't heard by April 1st, it's perfectly okay to try to email or phone the, the um, funder and say, look, you know, your deadline was April 1st. Um, when can we expect a decision? Don't ask them if you got funded, but just ask them generally, you know, when are you sending them out? Um, because like everybody else, they get behind um, it, it may be they have a backlog, somebody could have been out sick, or they're just not processing things. Um, you, you need a lot of patience. Sometimes it's a long review process, uh, but not hearing anything does not necessarily mean um, you're rejected. So please do follow up so you get some um, information. Okay, so let's see what makes a proposal stand out from others. Proposals are most successful, I think, when they're uh, all internally consistent, where the objectives and goals of the proposal match the budget, match the activities, uh, and match the, the context or, or context setting of the proposal. Generally, a proposal stands out from the rest if it's well written and concise. Um, and if it provides us with the level of detail that we need around the organization's program structure, financials, outcomes. For me, a proposal that stands out is one that is concise and that answers the questions that are on the website, which demonstrates that the person who is submitting the proposal has gone to our website, which I think is critical. Okay, so just in summary, uh, what makes a proposal stand out? Um, well written, we've talked about that. Being concise, not going on and on and on and repeating yourself. Um, in a whole bunch of different ways, a lot of words. And, and the goals match. You know, the goals match the, the questions that are asked. You're asking the questions. You're not leaving out anything that was in the requirements um, because it does make it more difficult to assess um, if, if, you're, if there's information that's omitted. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. I would say most often that I talk about is as a reader, I have to be inspired and excited. OK, I want to see that enthusiasm, that urgency, that passion that comes to the grant application. I mean, sometimes I read something and say, wow, this is such a cool project. You know, if I'm reading it and it goes, oh, so what? Um, and we'll talk about the so what factor later on. You know, that really doesn't mean anything. So, um, you know, again, be clear, concise and really talk about how the proposal will be um, um, carried out. Okay, my favorite part. This is called the don'ts or the magical thinking of grant applicants or the naivety of a grant applicant, if you want to think of it that way. So a lot of times I get calls from people inquiring about grants. This is usually before uh, they've applied. 
and uh, we're chatting and um, they'll say, you know what, we're a perfect fit for you. It's like, we're a great organization, we're a perfect fit. And I'm thinking, how do you know that you're a perfect fit with, with our organization? Isn't that a little bit presumptuous of you? Um, which it really is. Um, you know, and then there's always the rejecting the good advice, or I would also say the defensiveness. So let's say you contact me and you say, here's my, you know, can you give me some help with, so I know what to apply in kind of the area of employment. And I say, well, you know, I really can't tell you what we'd, we'd approve, but I can tell if you're in the ballpark of something we would read. Um, and you go through your whole project. And then I say, you know what? I really don't think that this is something that we're interested in funding. And you push back and you, you like, we're perfect. What are you talking about? And I'll say, basically, you know, if you want to apply, you're still able. But really, if you're rejecting the good advice. I'm trying to save you time and energy um, of not to apply because we don't think it's something that's going to move forward. And the other thing is you wouldn't believe all the phone calls I get with people who know nothing about our foundation. They haven't read our website. And really, that's um, that's not a good sign either. Um, so you don't want to just apply to make your numbers. I know some people may may have to apply to X number of grants, but really um, the idea is one application is one application. You want to send in quality applications and you want to do a lot of them. You know, if you send in 10 applications, you're more likely to get funded than if you just try one funder. And um, again, you know, the best way to get to know funders is when you're not looking for the grant and trying to networking or connecting them with some way. So let's move to the grant funding decision process. Your grant has been submitted. And I would say most of the time, this is kind of the ideal situation of what funders are looking for. You know, your grant application is confidential. They're really not going to talk about it with anybody outside the organization too much. Um, and I say too much because sometimes funders do share information, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, they're trying to be fair. They're looking for really excellence to move their own agenda and strategy forward. Um, they want to be efficient in their grant decision-making process, and they also want to try to be um, transparent. So the grant has been submitted. Uh, let's talk again a little bit of what happens. So typically in the grant review process, there's going to be some, some staff that's going to look at what comes in. They're maybe going to download it from the internet. They're going to check to make sure that it's complete, whatever documents that particular foundation um, was required um, is all submitted. And then it's going to be turned over for the staff that does the internal review. That could be the program officer. It could be other people, depending on the size of the foundation. I would say there's more fingers in the pot, a very large foundation, smaller foundation. This is probably limited staff. Um, and that person is going to, the program officer is going to look at that and see how it fits in with um, the work and the strategy of the foundation. They may use a rubric, which is kind of like a graph to, on different categories, seeing it and score it to see if it's, you know, well-written or it, you know, has the goals and the goals are what um, works, meshes with what the foundation is trying to achieve. You know, what's the budget, um, all those kinds of good things. And then once it's been, you know, reviewed tentatively and may go into one of three piles, at least that's the way I work. This is terrific. I need more information. This is probably something we might want to fund. And then something that goes into, I need information. This is okay, but I need more clarification. And then it may get tossed aside. It says there's, there's no way we're just going to fund this. And then those first two categories, it goes to a Q&A for clarification. Um, and I, I would say even the larger foundations reach out to get clarification on grant making. Uh, we've done some joint grant making with Microsoft uh, in uh, Washington and the Microsoft. And in fact, they have a very similar process that we do. They do reach out for information. They do use kind of a rubric and a template um, as they assess their, um, their uh, grantees, at least um, the, the group that we worked with. And there's more than one grant making group at uh, Microsoft. And then it's going to an internal review team. Um, it is going um, into, it may go to the internal review team, may include the CEO, 
Um, it may go to others, but there's a list that's going to be formed as potential grantees. And by the way, your full proposal is most of the time not used. It's usually condensed to a two page summary because if you're looking at a lot, uh, those other reviewers feel they can trust the staff and don't wanna review a whole proposal. Um, then it may go in our organization goes to a grants committee that um, kind of looks at the funding list. Um, they discuss it, they yay or nay it. And then it may go to a full board of directors uh, for approval. So it really depends on the organization um, on their internal review process. But, you know, there's more than just the words on the paper. Why should a foundation fund you? Are you moving our work? Uh, you know, are you moving our work forward? And again, it's more of an art than a science. You know, we have an internal strategic plan. It's sometimes shared, sometimes not shared. We know what we'd like to fund. We know... Um, if it's innovative, not innovative, um, but more importantly, I call it the so what factor, and that's where your you, how you write your grant comes in. If I'm reading um, a proposal and it's like, oh, so what? Who cares? Um, you really need to get beyond that. For example, if you're writing about, say, an art project, we want funds to fund an af um, after-school art project. Okay, so what? Who cares? You know, there's lots of art projects. There's lots of great organizations that run art projects. But why is yours really different? Are you doing site visits? Are you bringing in experts? Are you doing some other type of component in this project that really makes it stand out that engages um, the funder? And then the question is, can the applicant really do the work? Um, I've seen, we've funded projects from very large universities that's done terrible projects, and we've funded very small, taken a risk on small nonprofits that have done great projects. So, you know, you dig a little deeper, can the funder really do the work? And that's where, you know, I may call another funder, um, ABC Group, and I know ABC funded uh, this particular nonprofit that I'm looking at. What was the experience? Do you know the personnel? Do you know the staff? Um, also, I know a lot of people in the field. I may call other consultants. So there is that digging deeper that happens. Uh, that's kind of an informal network that really does behind the scene. Sometimes I'll pass off some things I didn't fund other funders to say, take a look at this. Uh, and recently something was funded in New Orleans from a group in California. Um, so there is that informal network that, you know, just like your nonprofits uh, and the work you do have your networks, foundations have their networks as well. Okay, let's move on and see what are the most common mistakes you may see in a proposal. Generally, the most common mistake we see from applicants in a proposal um, is not providing the level of detail that we've requested when asking them to submit the proposal. So we provide a checklist um, when we ask organizations to submit, and we really do need to see all of the pieces of information that we ask for. So generally, we're not getting the level of detail around the financials or the outcomes, for example, that we would need to see. I think the most common mistake is folks have not really done their homework and have not provided me with the information that we request on our website. And so it's critical that they go to the website first because we are very specific in the information that we ask for. For the Ford Foundation, our first contact with a grantee is usually through a letter of inquiry. And I think there are three common mistakes that at least I saw as a program officer. Uh, the first is that the grantee really hasn't taken the time to read our website or understand the work of the foundation, understand the kinds of things that we're funding. Um, the second thing is, and this is very common, is that we'll get a request uh, to replace some funding that's been cut either from government or from another funder, and that's just a very unappealing uh, place to start from in a conversation. And then the third is that um, there's really a lack of distinctiveness uh, in, the, in the letter of inquiry, uh, a distinctiveness that speaks to why the organization's approach or the organization itself is different from other kinds of grant seekers. So there you go, some of the things that we just talked about. Do your homework, read the website, and make yourself distinctive. Okay, so you've been turned down for the grant. Um, it's really an opportunity for discussion, right? It's to continue to build those relationships with the funder. Um, you can call or email with specific questions. Um, you know, was there any uh, part of the guidelines we missed? What suggestions do you have for the future? Can I reapply? 
Um, you know, and the other thing you can ask for is, do you know any other funders in the space? We get asked that all the time. But a lot of times it was just a business decision. You know, funders get way more applications than they're able to fund. And, you know, you really do have to make um, choices as a funder. Um, what's the impact? How closely does it tie to your strategic plan? Maybe it's you funded a similar project last year. Um, and you want to play the odds as the grantee. Again, you need to apply to lots and lots of places in order to have success and to get more experience with grant writing. Okay, so now you got the grant. Oh my God, your stress goes up. It's a You're having a panic attack. Um, you know, it's a great feeling of accomplishment, but at the same time, it's very, very scary because now you have to deliver on what you talked about or what you promised, right? Um, so you may get a notification about that you got the grant by an email, by a letter. Um, more importantly, however you get that notification, please send a thank you. That's always nice. Um, if you do want to have a public recognition event, ask the funder. Um, you know, for us, we don't want to really be presented with a big check or something like that um, for you to spend your money. We're giving you, um, you know, a grant because we know you're an organization that needs funds and you don't need to um, spend unnecessary funds on that. Um, more importantly, though, be sure to notify the funder about any immediate changes you have, uh, whether it's, um, you know, staff left in between the time you applied or there's a budget change or you need to do some sort of modification. And also let them know about the good stuff. So, for example, if you got in the newspaper about your agency or this program in between the time you applied, um, it's always good to share those things as well. So let's quickly go through um, some grant evaluation. And it's really the process that determines the impact, the effectiveness and efficiency of what you're doing, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and the primary purpose isn't really to satisfy the funder, but it's really to help an organization assess the effectiveness of its work. If you wanna think about is continuous quality of uh, improvement and how to plan for future success. So evaluation, think of it this way, is really your friend. Um, it's, it could be informal, it could be informal, um, but the productivity looks at the inputs and outputs of your project, what's happening, what's not happening. Uh, effectiveness is, you know, what's the relationship between the goals and the outcomes, what's really happening. Uh, quality is the quality of the work, you know, the quality of the staff, the quality of your collaborations, um, how good are the materials you've created, how good is the white paper or manual you created, and the timeliness is whether the project really finished on time. If you're, um, you know, here are some things that you can think about as you're going through the grant process to evaluate it internally. You know, what has happened? Why has it happened? Especially if there's an issue, is it going to continue? What are we going to do about it? Um, sometimes, um, you know, lots of times actually funders will help you with these kinds of um, troubleshooting. And from a funder's perspective, when we're done with the project, you know, was the grantee able to implement the project? What was the project? What was made? Um, what progress was made, what worked, what didn't work, what were some of the challenges, and what are the implications for future grants? Now, that's really something you may not be thinking about, but, you know, when I have a project that's completed, I'll look at it and say, well, if this grantee applies again, would I fund it? Um, from a sp perspective of not necessarily what they're asking for, but how well the organization did as they worked through the grant, because they could have had a terrible project, it didn't work out, it was beyond their circumstances, but if they kept us well informed, we had a good relationship, um, you know, I probably would fund them again. Okay, we're almost done and then we'll have some time for questions. So I, I know uh, Rebecca's going to uh, send you a PDF of the slides so you don't have to worry about writing these down. Um, but there are ways of finding out grant opportunities. Uh, you can look at some of the listservs that are out there. There's Candid at the Foundation Center, and a few of these are subscriptions. Uh, there's GrantWatch, GrantStation, NewMobility.com. If you go online and serve grant opportunities, you'll probably find some. Uh, Candid or the Foundation Center has a publication called P&D Grants, which I also get, and it lists, it comes every week, and it lists grants opportunities out there um, nationally. 
Um, some disability specific foundations, you have the Craig Nielsen Foundation in California, they have an open RFP specifically on SCI or related disabilities. Christopher and Dana Reef Foundation in Jersey has really opened it more to mobility as well as spinal cord injury. Uh, you have the With Foundation in California, they do a lot of health and disability. Uh, Ruderman Family Foundation and Mitsubishi Electric are um, both foundations that are private foundations but do focus on disability. And the SL Foundation Zero Project, I wanted to mention, uh, they're based in Vienna. Uh, they don't give out grants, but they give out awards for programs that you currently have. So if you run a program, uh, they have a call for nominations, usually in uh, the spring or summer. And they give out small stipends to not only come to Vienna, but uh, small stipends for the project that you had. For um, those in disability research, there's Department of Defense grants, National Institutes of Health, NIDLA grants, and uh, for New Jersey specific grants, besides uh, the New Jersey Commission on Brain Injury Research, uh, the New Jersey Commission on Spinal Cord Injury Research, and the New Jersey Department of Labor. I would say there's many other grants in New Jersey that are available. You just need to go on the state website and find out. So that brings us almost to the end. There's two books that um, I've used. One of them is Winning Grants Step-by-Step, Step, the complete workbook. Um, that's a really good book. It's in more than one public, uh, more than one version now. I think there's a recent version out. Uh, it has some worksheets in it. And um, the foundation is more uh, Great American Secret. It's more of a, a textbooky kind of um, book about philanthropy if you're interested in that. Um, I'm going to put up my contact information for a minute and then return it back to Rebecca and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Elaine. I feel like you packed in so much good information in that 40 minutes, um, so thank you. Um, we already have some questions that are starting to show up in the chat, so um, if you don't mind, I'll read you the first one. Um, in addition to the required documents such as 990 and audit, how much does it help? Oh, we shifted. How much does it help to attach, upload supplemental additional documents such as an annual report, photos, program bro brochures, et cetera? I think it depends what the um, funder is asking for. Um, you know, if you think about, they're going to get a lot of applications. So typically our national, and we're small, so typically our national um, applications have 75 applications. I'm not going to go through all those materials. I think if you're, um, if they ask you for supplemental materials or it's really a key material, um, I think that's when you can ask them for more information. But it's on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess. Great, thank you. We also have, um, do you prefer to fund new programs where you are the major or sole funder, or do you prefer existing programs? Uh, for Kessler Foundation, we'll do both. I think otherwise it really depends on the foundations. Most foundations prefer not to fund new programs. Um, we are ones that take a risk. We're actually known for our innovation. So we do fund specifically new programs that haven't been tried. Thank you. Um, Interpreter Allison, I have a question from Octavio. He would like to ask directly through you. Would you be able to unmute and interpret for him, please? Yes, indeed. OK, um, one moment. I'm going to attempt to pin him. OK, go ahead. Hello there. My name is Octavio. I am deaf. And I was trying to figure out how to write a grant, but, you know, basically I sent a grant to an organization, you know, I would like to send a grant to an organization that is familiar with hearing impaired people or deaf people, you know, some sort of organization that is familiar with the term deaf. So you know, uh, there are some people who really don't understand deaf culture. They don't actually understand that hearing impaired is a pejorative word. So, you know, we're really trying to figure out, uh, you know, different organizations that we can write grants to that kind of have a deaf awareness. Um, well, my suggestion may be to try to contact Gallaudet University and see if they have a, in their library have a reference to get a list of foundations that may be favorable for um, serving the deaf community. 
the, the group of disability funders is really, really small. And um, I think most organizations that serve deaf populations just contact regular funders, but part of that goal may be to, um, you know, work with the funder to understand the needs of the community. Um, Ford Foundation does have some disability funding that goes specifically for advocacy in the deaf community, if that's what you're interested in. Thank you. Um, our next question is when it fits, oh, sorry, Octavia, are you still? No, all good, he was just saying. Okay. It sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So our next question is when it fits within the budget, is there any reason not to request the max funding for the, from the foundation? Um, to play the game, everybody, everybody <laughs> asks for the max funding. Um, I've had grants that go like pennies under, or, I mean, I, I would say it's always good to end on, at least for us, um, you know, we try to round up the dollar. We don't give, you know, $14.95 $14 example for a grant. Um, I would say most people do. It, what you want to do is make sure it's a real cost for the grant, because otherwise every funders know you're playing the game. Um, and the grantees know you're going to cut the budget slightly. If you're asking for $50,000, the grantees know you're probably going to give less than that. And funders know we're probably going to fund less than that. So, but you really want to do be realistic if you can. Um, everybody pads their budgets. That's just kind of a thing. Thank you. Um, the next question says, what are your views on applying for general operating support versus a specific program? I would say some the, the convention now in the grant philanthropy world is that more funders should be supporting operating grants, indirect costs, those types of things. However, the realistic um, picture is that most funders do not fund that, um, but they may have some indirect costs that are covered in their grants. So I, I again, you know, it's what the grant, the funder says in the grant request, um, if they're going to fund operating or they're going to fund programming. But you should always include some indirect costs in your grant. Okay, and the there's a follow up question to that, which is how do you think one can work capital improvements into a proposal. I think capital uh, improvements are a specific type of grant and a lot of funders will not we will not fund capital improvements, so you really need to seek out those grant makers that do. Like I know Hyde and Watson in New Jersey typically does fund capital. So there are funders who are known for funding capital and that's where you may want to use a public funder. Um, you know, there are a public funders, depending on what you're building, um, you know, city funds, um, community development funds, though, those are really a whole different area. Capital, I think, is a whole different ballgame. Thank you. Um, we have another question. How common is it to fund the same organization more than just one grant cycle? Is it best to apply continuation of the work from the first cycle? I think that's an interesting question and it's really um, peculiar to each funder. So we specifically state on our website for local grant making, we will fund up to three years approving um, each year in a project. We have funded um, organizations um, on a year two of the same project, so, but you still had to apply. So it really depends. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger the grants, the bigger the funders, typically they're funding two or three year grants. Um, our large signature grants, which are up to a half a million dollars, are, are typically funded two years at a time. Um, so it really, it really depends on what's in the grant requirements. And usually funders will state that on their website. Okay, and I have another question. If, if you've been denied once, do you think it's worth reapplying or do grantors tend to recognize the name and move on to the next? I think that's where you need to network. So you need to find out why um, you know you were rejected. Was it because you didn't fit completely? You know, I mean, I've I've had, for example, in the early years, we had calls for employment and would get housing grants. So of course that's going to be rejected. Um, but if nobody calls me to find out why, 
Um, we just don't typically send to everybody who gets rejected a reason. Um, but in this case, sometimes we do. We say, you know, it didn't meet the grant requirements or something like that. But if you don't really know what the grant requirements are and don't dig deeper, you wouldn't know. Um, I, we have funded people, actually, we have <laughs> in our history, we funded an organization applied probably five times because they couldn't, they didn't know how to write a grant. And finally, we sat down with them to help them write a grant that we knew would be funded because they had great concepts, but they just needed help grant writing. So, you know, the smaller the foundation, sometimes will give you assistance too. So it, it could be anything, but I would say you need to find out why that grant was not funded before you apply again for the same thing. Thank you. Um, so we do not have any more questions in the chat. Does anybody want to unmute and ask anything or place any in the chat? I have one I can ask in the interim while you're thinking. Uh, I was wondering, the gentleman from Ford had noted that uh, he didn't enjoy talking about grant proposals where you were starting from the deficit of having lost grant funding from somewhere else. Um, so if someone has a project that they're passionate about and for whatever reason they've been unable to get funding from a, another source and they're trying to get funding for you to continue that work with you, how would you want them to approach that um, to market themselves well? Well, I think you don't want to say, you know, you want to continue this project because you lost funding. I think you want to say, you know, our um, we want to move forward with this project. We think we can expand and contract it in order to do that. We need additional funding. You know, there's ways of, I mean, it's, you know, if you think of a grant application, it's really marketing and communications. I mean, you're marketing your organization through your words um, to somebody else. And you don't want to say, well, I'm only applying to you because I lost my money. That's basically what he's saying. You know, you want to apply. And, and we've had organizations say, you know, we want to continue a program. We don't know where we're going to get future funding. Um you know, that's more attractive than saying, I'm only basically he's saying, you know, if, if somebody tells you they're only applying to you because they lost their money and they think you're a source, that's, you know, it's like, so what? Everybody loses funding. Why should we fund you? Thank you. I, I see that Arlene has raised her hand. Um, Arlene, feel free to unmute and ask. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Arlene Romoff. I'm deaf and I have cochlear implants that I used to hear. Uh, I've been advocating uh, since the ADA was signed on many different issues. One issue that we're facing right now, and it's been on the, on the platform for 30 years, is assistive listening systems for people with hearing loss, which uh, is part of the ADA, but generally ignored. The uh, technology of choice are uh, induction loops, sometimes called hearing loops, prevalent in Europe, Europe but relatively new here. And we're getting uh, money from the Department of Human Services that were given to 13 counties to install loops. But obviously this is just a start. And so I'm looking at how to assist counties, municipalities that, for example, need to install induction loops in their libraries, in their council chambers, so people with hearing loss can walk in and participate. I'm not going to be writing them, but I really wanted to know what this grant process was about. So uh, in advocating for this, what could I advise these municipalities how to get their money uh, in a way that I have no experience with that, but perhaps you do. Well, that's a, a more of a public funding issue, which I'm not that familiar with the public sector, but, you know, there is money available for um, communities. Sometimes there's community development funding. There's also not, private not-for-profits that are funding inclusion for underserved populations and communities. I mean, that's where I would focus looking at um, those, I mean, because there may also um, besides the, the deaf community, there may be those with visual impairments who need access to documents and Braille as well. So it may be looking at a broader ask than just the deaf community. Um, but well, it's, it, not, it's not deaf, it's uh, especially uh, what's really coming up now, uh, uh, the aging population with a lot of attention on that. Because so there's, with that, uh, you have a lot of people that right. Are so there's there. accessibility money. I mean, that then the key is focused on accessibility for all within your community and looking for dollars um, from, I, I would say, you know, public sources. There are some foundations that do that, but really accessibility 
um, there, there's a lot of attention to that right now. Okay, I appreciate your answer. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm not that sure. <laughs> not familiar with the municipalities again, where they get their funding. All right. Uh, it, it's really, this is the topic of the moment because a lot of attention is being spent on aging issues. And this is right. uh, and with people being able to remain active in the community. This is the way to do it. And uh, discreetly. So many, many uh, facets of this. But I hope you'll be hearing more about this because it really, it's, it's, it's time has come. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time probably for one more question. I see that Carrie has her hand raised and um, so I'll turn it over to her. Hi, Elaine. Uh, thank you for your training today. I'm happy to be here. Um, I was wondering if, uh, if an agency has been awarded a grant in the past and the project was not particularly successful, whether because of the program or the staff at the time, how would you recommend an agency approach a funder um, and convey that this new project would be successful either with the staff in place or because of the project itself? You know, that brings up a really interesting point, which I forgot to mention. So if you've applied to um, a foundation and you're you're completed that project and now you're in the second year and you want to apply again mention the project you had before um, some people never ever mention it um, which is like if i gave you funding before why wouldn't you mention that you're like looking for round two so i would mention in the in the grant application that you know you had gotten dollars for this and since then your organization has improved in these ways kind of a thing um, or if it's a totally different project, then it's really irrelevant, really. Um, but I would mention that, you know, you're a past grantee and you appreciated the funds and you're looking to do X, Y, Z. Um, but you mentioned, I mean, I did have a grant application where year two, they never even mentioned the year before we gave the money. And it was for the same project. They didn't even talk about how it turned out. So that's a bit disappointing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you, Elaine. This was so informative and useful. And I I, um, I really appreciate you coming and supporting us in this way. Um, I'd like to thank our interpreter, Allison, for being here today as well. And as always, I would like to thank the New Jersey Division of Disability Services for funding these trainings as well as the grants program. And um, so thank you all. And we hope to see you again soon. Take care.